This video is brought to you by BetterHelp. Neoliberalism. It's become a catch-all term to describe why things are bad or unfair, or why some folks are so rich while most of us are pretty broke. Now, for some, the term's been overused to the point of meaninglessness, or has even become a slur. What a world where that, that's, you're, you're like, oh, it's a slur, you called me a neoliberal. Nice life, nice life if that's, if that's your slur. But it's actually pretty simple. Neoliberalism describes the political and economic movement most notably perpetuated by Reagan and Thatcher in the 80s and which now dominates most parts of the world. It emphasizes free markets, limited government intervention, i.e. minimal provision of public services, and unfettered capitalism. Writer and academic David Harvey describes neoliberalism as a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. The role of the state is to create and preserve the institutional framework appropriate to such practices. It must set up those military, defense, police, and legal structures and functions required to secure private property rights and to guarantee by force if need be the proper functioning of markets. And if you want to learn more about neoliberalism, David Harvey is probably the best person to start reading, so you can check out his brief history of neoliberalism or basically any of his books and they'll be good. He also has some good lectures on YouTube. During the post-war period, neoliberalism was something of a fringe position in economics, but the financial shocks of the 70s gave it the perfect opportunity to spread its wings and fly. Famously, a group of University of Chicago economists nicknamed the Chicago Boys used Pinochet's CIA-backed coup in Chile as a sort of testing lab for neoliberalism. Um, it, it went pretty terribly, but neoliberalism's reputation escaped unscathed. For all of our Chilean friends out there, if you have thoughts on this, let us know, we'd love to hear them. Today, a neoliberal is basically someone who looks around at the various interrelated crises facing our world and believes that the remedy is more capitalism. Now, some might rightly point to the era of economic and technological innovation experienced in the West as evidence of neoliberalism's positive effects, or point to countries who have resisted neoliberalism to justify its immense value. While others might still feel like neoliberalism has become more like a culture than a system of economics. And maybe that's not such a wild idea. Maybe the best way to understand neoliberalism isn't to think of it as a political ideology, but rather as an all-encompassing spiritual and metaphysical system. Now, this might sound wild, but today we're gonna try to explain why neoliberalism might be a religion. We have become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of the economy. Okay, but before we keep going, I wanna stop and give a shout out to our sponsor, BetterHelp. Now, if you've experienced anxiety or depression or just generally felt kind of overwhelmed lately, BetterHelp is a resource that can help you feel better. Now, to, uh, to risk an overshare, guys, um, I'm someone that struggles with things like ADHD and depression, and having a therapist has been really helpful. And in recent years, seeing a therapist regularly has helped me make a lot of progress and just feeling a lot more functional and happy. So, you know, big fan of therapy here. Now, BetterHelp's network of more than 30,000 therapists are ready to listen to and help you. After taking a brief questionnaire, you'll be matched with a therapist whose expertise fits your unique needs. And thanks to BetterHelp's remote model, you can work with a therapist whose skills might not otherwise be available in your area. You can message your therapist at any time and you'll receive timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule your choice of phone or video sessions to receive counseling in real time. Now, in the event that you and your therapist aren't a perfect match, you can easily switch to a new one for no additional charge. So, join the more than 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with BetterHelp by visiting betterhelp.com slash wisecrack. Or you can click the link in the description. When you do, you're gonna get 10% off your first month. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash wisecrack. Okay, now let's get back to breaking down the theology of neoliberalism. Okay, so at first glance, this might seem like a bit of a stretch. Obviously, neoliberalism doesn't have churches, creeds, and worship music. Well, at least not officially. Cash rules everything around me. Green, get the money. Dollar, dollar bill, 
But as we talked about in a recent video, the framework of religion can help us understand passionate and faith-based behaviors that have nothing to do with pastors telling you that you're gonna go to hell for loving yourself. I'm talking about masturbation. Now, as we've established, unfettered capitalism is integral to neoliberalism. And luckily for us, philosopher Walter Benjamin established a relationship between capitalism and religion back in 1921 in his fragment, Capitalism as Religion. Benjamin writes that a religion may be discerned in capitalism. That is to say, capitalism serves essentially to allay the same anxieties, torments, and disturbances to which the so-called religions offered answers. And Benjamin establishes four key components of the religious structure of capitalism. Now let's start with the first two and later, if you've earned it, we'll take a look at the third and fourth. Spoiler alert, you've already earned it. First, Benjamin claims that capitalism, of which neoliberalism is the number one boy, is a purely cultic religion. What he goes on to explain means that capitalism has no specific body of dogma, no theology. Basically, capitalism doesn't have a Ten Commandments or a system of codified beliefs like what you generally get in organized religions. Instead, it's sort of like one of those weird college fraternities or sororities that's, that's powerful because of its secrecy. This would make sense of why the adherents of neoliberalism might deny that they even exist. And they don't necessarily have their own Bible, a, a sort of sacred text that explains it all. But much like a cultic religion, neoliberalism could be seen as sustaining itself not via text, but by sacred practices and festivities, i.e. it's an economic system. Now, as Benjamin writes, in capitalism, things have a meaning only in their relationship to the cult, which basically means that under capitalism, things are meaningful in so much as they have a direct relationship to the economy. For example, a college major is only useful if it leads to a high paying job or solutions to climate change are only possible if conducive to growing new markets. Now this gets us to Benjamin's second point about the religious structure of capitalism, namely that the cult is permanent. He writes, capitalism is the celebration of a cult without dream of mercy. There are no weekdays. There is no day that is not a feast day in the terrible sense that all its sacred pomp is unfolded before us. Each day commands the utter fealty of each worshiper. Okay, let's unpack this. So think about how in recent years, um, your car is no longer just a place to get you and the boys to happy hour at Outback Steakhouse. It's now a potential source of revenue when you use your weekends or evenings to drive for Uber. And your spare bedroom is no longer a place where your college buddies can crash. It's a short-term rental opportunity on Airbnb. And even your nine to five job is slowly creeping into your free time as you struggle to keep up with the Joneses. Also show of hands in the comments, if you've ever looked at Slack, while sitting on the toilet on the weekend. And don't lie, don't lie, just, you gotta be honest. Now the pursuit of the ends of capitalism is what neoliberalism constantly demands. Compare this to other religions where followers come together on specific days, like Sundays or holidays like Christmas, Yom Kippur or Ramadan. Instead of this type of practice in which religious celebration is detached from business as usual, the cult of capital requires constant participation. Every day is Sunday. And while you can stop going to church without going to hell, at least in this life, if we stop participating in the church of capital, we'll no longer be able to afford basic necessities and potentially die in a gutter. This is important because capitalism is not an opt-in religion. It's imposed on us from the top down. Sort of like how your parents keep telling you that you're a Presbyterian because you were born into their family. To put the religion of neoliberalism into perspective, it's worth taking a detour to pre-Columbian Aztec religion. And just to note that the Aztec Empire wasn't an empire in the traditional sense, but rather an alliance of three city-states. Now the Aztecs very famously engaged in a lot of human sacrifice. And this actually drove the expansion of the Triple Alliance Mexican state. Because basically when everyone believes that sacrifice is necessary to keep things functioning, people are quick to come together under leaders who tell them what to do. Now the Aztecs or Mexica believed that the world had already been destroyed a number of times and that it was, for lack of a better term, getting a bit worn out. I mean, I mean, who, who can't relate to feeling that, you know? And according to their beliefs, when our son was created, it was supposed to have been created out of a young, strong God. But a sort of cosmic mix-up happened, and it was created from a weak, old one. Basically, the son was supposed to be Chris Hemsworth, but instead, uh, we, we got Christopher Lloyd. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads.
The result is that our sun sucks and it won't keep rising every day unless we fuel it. And what does the sun run on? Well, obviously the sacrificed bodies of humans. So the Aztecs needed prisoners to keep fueling their shitty sun. Now you might be thinking that this sounds like a bloodthirsty horror, a practice indicative of some archaic past. But, and go with me here, it's actually not all that different from how neoliberalism operates today. While we might not need to slit throats to fuel the sun, we need to continue to feed our hungry god, the economy. What people really should be doing is spending more. And whenever it has a problem, the solution is basically human sacrifice. Bad economy? Cut jobs. The rich want more money. Cut taxes and public services and raise taxes on the poor. Also, if you saw our recent video on child labor, it's basically this, right? Like. What do we do if we need more cheap labor? We'll sacrifice the childhood of children, put them in dangerous working conditions because it serves the economy. We're currently living through a moment in which inflation is one of the dominant economic phenomena. And many of us are trying to understand what it is and why it's making our lives worse. Now, one explanation is that it's being driven by rising energy prices, which is leading to rising food prices. Some central banks have responded by raising interest rates because they believe the cause of rising prices has to do with wages being too high. Um, hey, if you think you're getting paid too much, let us know in the comments. And then click on the link in the description to go to our Patreon page and give us some of your surplus income. Now, in the years since COVID began, economic growth has increasingly been the main barometer of societal well-being, at least according to the news media and many politicians who often seem more concerned with greater economic growth than less people dying. In the current economic climate, at least here in the United States, Folks are dealing with inflation, stagnating wages, and a rising cost of housing, healthcare, and consumer goods. And we just kind of got to suck it up because, um, well, well, what's the other option? And of course, we're increasingly dependent on market-based solutions for all our needs, as extreme privatization is one of the unwritten commandments of neoliberalism. This is all because neoliberalism imposes capitalism as an overarching belief system from the top down and forces us to participate in the system as real or potential sacrifices. Now, does this mean that the neoliberal priests are gonna drag us into the center of town to performatively shank us? Probably not. But it does mean that the high priests of neoliberalism are gonna make decisions from their offices on Wall Street or in Washington that will trickle down to the rest of us and absolutely put people's lives in danger. Whether it's sacrificing those who can't afford cancer treatment, those who can barely afford a studio apartment, or those who work three jobs just to keep their head above water. And according to Benjamin, this means that under capitalism, human sacrifice is happening all the time. It's a feature, not a glitch. But for him, capitalism isn't just a religion and a sanctioned form of human sacrifice that's celebrated all the time. It also has a very particular point to it that's also pretty difficult to grasp. So to get back to his list, the third thing he tells us about the religious structure of capitalism is that it makes guilt pervasive. Whereas other religions like Christianity aim to alleviate guilt by creating atonement or forgiveness for its followers, i.e. Jesus died for your sins and God forgives you, capitalism intentionally manufactures guilt, i.e. your life sucks because you're not working hard enough, so pull yourself up, buy your own bootstraps, uh, no free lunches, etc. We must let the economy know that we are capable of respecting it! And some of you might be thinking like, but, but religion makes me feel really guilty. So doesn't religion do that too? Like maybe Christianity especially? One could actually argue that it's the effect of capitalism on religion that made it do that. Now you can never be truly saved from the perspective of the neoliberal economic structure. There's no Jesus to liberate your bank account from the grips of debt or bad credit. Even and perhaps especially, the most outrageously wealthy pricks on the planet are still driven to appropriate more and more wealth for themselves. You can never have enough. There is always more. There is no such thing as too much piety. As Benjamin writes, a vast sense of guilt that is unable to find relief seizes on the cult, not to atone for this guilt, but to make it universal, to hammer it into the conscious mind, so as once and for all to include God in the system and thereby awaken in him an interest in the process of atonement. Now, while this might sound a bit too poetic to describe our current moment, we do see this in the trends of hustle and entrepreneurial culture. And all the videos on this very website with people telling you about how you can make extra money in your free time. Guys, let me tell you this, they're all full of shit. 
it. Any video on this website where someone's like, here's how I, oh, drop shipping, make money, hustle, grind, this is my car, da da da. They are all full of shit. Thank you, that's been my TED talk. And recently we've seen politicians use guilt as a tool to make people feel bad for not having good jobs or for being on unemployment or for wanting their student loan debt forgiven. This is a professional class bailout. Also notice that when we talk about debt, it, it has to be forgiven, uh, except not by a God, but by a bank. Now, according to the Bible, um, the meek will inherit the earth and, and blessed are the poor. And even the lowest can be raised to the highest with God's love. But under neoliberalism, even God needs to come down to earth and pay his own way as no one gets to skip the line. Heaven simply isn't profitable enough to be left on its own. Benjamin finds this aspect of the capitalist religion to be completely despairing, but he also thinks that it's capitalism's secret hope. He writes, capitalism is entirely without precedent and that it is a religion which offers not the reform of its existence, but its complete destruction. It is the expansion of despair until despair becomes a religious state of the world and the hope that this will lead to salvation. God's transcendence is at an end, but he is not dead. He has been incorporated into human existence. Um, this is a topic for another time, but for Benjamin and others, sometimes this despair can be good as if things get so incredibly shitty, we might be motivated to create our own salvation. Now he's saying that capitalism aims to appropriate absolutely everything, people, nature, even God, and then submit them all to its law. And if the God thing sounds a little weird, take a second and think about the mega church and prosperity gospel phenomena, where religion has seamlessly merged with neoliberal culture. Someday. Now, if nothing else, Benjamin might be seen as anticipating the environmental crisis and why neoliberalism doesn't really seem too concerned about doing anything to, uh, to like stop it. Because existence as we know it doesn't really matter. Only the market does. Human lives can be sacrificed so long as the economy grows. Now, the question you might be asking is like, why? Why is all of this? But Benjamin gives an answer to this with, his fourth point uh, about the religious structure of capitalism, which is that it's God must be hidden from it and may be addressed only when his guilt is at its zenith. The cult is celebrated before an unmatured deity. This means that there is some ultimate purpose to which everything in capitalism is tending towards, however destructively, but this purpose isn't clear to us yet. We're basically just Dorothy at the entrance of the Emerald City. At the present moment, it seems like the best we can do to please the invisible gods of the market is just to rush headfirst into perpetuating the system as it stands. Our survival is at stake after all. So let guilt be our North Star, the market be our God and make atonement impossible, all in the hopes that maybe one day the ghost of Milton Friedman will tell us what it was all for. The economy is our shepherd. We shall not want. Now, this probably isn't what any actual neoliberal would say about their system of beliefs, at least not in public, but it feels like one of the best explanations we have. And according to Benjamin, neoliberalism is a religion which aims to incorporate everything into an endless, destructive, sacrificial ritual, which makes atonement impossible and guilt universal. Everyone and everything must be continually sacrificed to the market because of, of like profit for your boss. And maybe the real reason that so many folks willfully continue to remain members of the Church of Neoliberalism is a belief that they just have enough faith and make enough sacrifice that one day they'll be the ones sitting in the front pew at Neoliberalism Sunday service getting first dibs at the money and the offering plate. But what do you guys think? Is neoliberalism the one faith that's brought the whole world together, whether we realize it or not? Should we get to have a big party welcoming us into the neoliberal community when we turn 13? Or is there a danger of economics becoming a spiritual way of life? Please let me know what you think in the comments. Um, before we go, I wanna give just a massive shout out to all of our patrons. God, you help us a lot and we really love it. Um, if you wanna support us and also if you hate ads, if you see me like read ads in videos and you're just like, whoa, I wanna puke, I can't do this. Then sign up for our Patreon because you get all our videos early and with no ads along with extra content, access to our Discord server and you know, other stuff. So consider that, it's a big help to us. But you know what else is a big help? Watching these videos, um, commenting, sharing, liking, subscribing, setting alerts, feeding the algorithm. It means so, so much to us. Um, and I pray 
that you keep doing those things. In the meantime, try to not let yourself be a human sacrifice, and I'll see you later.